So very warm welcome and good afternoon everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Cathy Willis, I'm the current principal of St Edmund Hall and it gives me very great pleasure after two years here to welcome you to the first in our series of fellowship lunchtime lectures which will be held weeks two, four, six and eight each term. We've established these seminars to enable members of the college community both past and present to gain a small insight into some of the fascinating work that's being undertaken by, by our tutorial fellows. We're often all so busy teaching and rushing around and doing meetings, we forget to talk about the research we're doing. And just scanning the fellowship list, there's some really fascinating topics of, of work that people are doing. So who better to give the first of these but uh, um, is Andrew Kahn who is the Professor of Russian Literature in the Faculty of Medieval and Modern Languages. And he's also the Vladimir Patanin Tutorial Fellow in Russian Literature at St Edmund Hall. So Andrew's been with us some time. He was elected as the first Tutorial Fellow in Russian in 1993, and has been teaching undergraduates and graduates in the Hall ever since that time. So that must be at least over well over 100 students that have been through um, Andrew's tutoring. Um, you only have to Google, um, Google Andrew to see how impressive his publication list is. And with numerous articles and books on diverse topics from 18th century literature and thought in Russia to the poetry of Pushkin, Mandelstam and Brodsky. So really, really interesting topics here. And in recognition of his, his exceptional scholarship, Andrew was made a fellow of the British Academy in 2019. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand the screen over to Andrew to talk to us today on Russia's first dangerous book. So Andrew, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank, you, thank, you, thank you for the introduction. Uh, very glad to, uh, to see names and uh, to see faces uh, in, in due course. Uh, and thank you for the chance to share my interest with all who have signed on to this talk. Uh, it's also very nice to be introduced by a principal whose name is Catherine, since another Catherine, Catherine the Great, also a reforming leader, also a lover of gardens, is a key figure in these remarks. My hero, Alexander Radishev, failed to stay on the right side of his Catherine, so may history not repeat itself. Uh, I don't know what the equivalent of exile to Siberia would be at Teddy Hall. Norham Gardens doesn't sound so bad. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to um, put some slides up. Uh, there'll be a PowerPoint um, really pretty much from start to finish. Uh, and uh, I think I'll be reduced to a postage stamp uh, in the corner somewhere, which uh, is as it should be. So share the screen and share um, and from start. There we are. So um, I hope everyone can, can see that. Uh, this lunchtime talk takes us to St. Petersburg. I'm, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes, a I hope a little less. So this lunchtime talk takes us to St. Petersburg, Russia, a splendid new 18th century city founded by Peter the Great in 1703. And there you have Peter in, I think, 1716, 1717, uh, looking every inch the uh, the successful, uh, the successful emperor. As Russia's new capital, the city with its grid plan and gleaming spires, its neoclassical architect architectural complexes, symbolize Peter's modernization of Russia, run as a rationally ordered state or Reichstadt. Peter's legacy, which included the foundation of the Academy of Sciences, was pushed forward mightily by Catherine the Great, whose reign began in 1762 with the coup that put her on the throne. She became a celebrity, renowned for being not just an enlightened absolute ruler, but renowned also as an intellectual and pa patron of thinkers. So uh, here is Catherine. Uh, she had many, many mythic, mythological, neoclassical guises. So here she is as the Roman goddess of wisdom, uh, the protectress of the arts. And indeed, um, she um, was a very keen patron and subsidized all sorts of projects and institutions. And then uh, you've got here just as a, a sort of snapshot of her celebrity and her networking capacity, you've got a map that comes from a, another project of mine, which is a digital database that um, I've been developing um, of Catherine's correspondence. There's something like 11,000 letters that uh, are not really collected 
uh, and are not searchable. And with my young colleague, uh, Kelsey Rubin Detlev, who was once upon a time my graduate student, we've been digitizing them and creating a database. Um, the Patanin Foundation has very generously given me some help for the project uh, in cataloging the metadata. And I just had a very substantial grant from the John Fell Foundation, which will allow us to complete the pilot uh, and have a launch, I hope, in the early um, summer. So Catherine, uh, anyone who is anyone wanted to be in touch with Catherine uh, the Great and those um, lines there, although it looks a bit like a, a cat's cradle, give you a, a sense of the extent of her networking, correspondence, diplomatic reach. I'll have more to say about the character of her reign shortly uh, and why the ferocious clash between her and Rajishiv was in some ways unexpected and why, in my view, the standard explanation looks in some ways unconvincing. It's hard to escape the perception, and the perception is its own fact, that Russian literature is famed for its oppositional writers. In my youth, that meant Solzhenitsyn against Brezhnev. Before that, Mandelstam and Stalin, Bulgakov and Stalin, and before that, Alexander Pushkin against Tsar Nicholas I. Even before these now notorious collisions, there was Radishev and Catherine. And so here you have the only known portrait uh, of Alexander Radishev, who's quite a striking um, figure. And even now, although I've been reading his text and, and studying it and have just translated uh, his most famous book, even now um, I have questions about the nature of one of the course celebre of Russian imperial history. So the talk I've prepared is something of a is something of a pantomime horse. There is the book launch element, which I'll explain in a minute, and that's a chance to talk to the broad public uh, you represent. And then there is the storytelling element involved in presenting a case study. And then there's the genuine drama, and, 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 and that's where the genuine drama and pathos lie. And then there is the research element. So although this isn't a seminar, I don't want you to go away after a lunchtime talk saying, where's the beef? Uh, there has to be a problem, there has to be uh, a question. And I think actually th the problem is a genuine one. Uh, and the case study, it remains very much, I think, an open dossier. So the occasion for talking about uh, this topic rather than other interests is a recently completed project. Uh, it's, this, it's this book, uh, which has just been published by Columbia University Press. It's the first translation of this classic work uh, in 70, years. The only other translation into English is, has long been out of print and is highly unsatisfactory in many um, respects. The, although th that's not to uh, damn my predecessors uh, because um, the book is thought to be untranslatable and to some extent almost unreadable. Uh, it's a very challenging, linguistically very challenging work. So uh, in collaboration with my friend and colleague Irina Reithman of Columbia University, uh, who's a, a very distinguished 18th century scholar, we've translated um, the Radishev. And this is the third in a series of translations I've done of important Russian works from the 18th century that are little known in English. In English. Uh, it's a sort of moonlighting habit. Um, and they join my involvement also in a new translation of Montesquieu's Persian Letters. So that was translated by Margaret Malden uh, uh, with me as editor, uh, a splendid cover. Uh, and Montesquieu is an important figure here too, so I'm not just taking the opportunity to show you a, a smart cover, but Montesquieu was a terribly important uh, figure in the intellectual life of Catherine the Great uh, and in her life as a legislator, and, and we'll come on to that shortly. Uh, I've also done uh, um, this first ever anthology in any language of Catherine the Great's selected letters. I mentioned that she came to the throne uh, in a putsch, in fact, it was her husband who was deposed and murdered, and the only known account of it um, is, is by Catherine in a fantastic breathless letter she wrote to her lover Stanislaw Ponitowski, uh, in, who was in Poland at the time, and that I think is number 11 in the um, anthology, and well worth reading, and gives you a sample of her skills as a writer. So she's an excellent writer, um, and in doing these translations, and then there's, um, I think, the first in the series, in some ways, the most important book, um, this has been a mission, I suppose, to open up, broaden, um, create dialogue between Russianists in the 18th century area, in the Enlightenment sphere, and other specialists, because uh, Enlightenment studies is a strong growth area. So building bridges within my discipline has been an aim 
and it may be paying off a bit. So I'm hoping that the Rajeshiv will be assigned in graduate courses and undergraduate courses and will get the interest of historians and literature scholars um, who um, do not read uh, Russian. Uh, the translation of the Rajeshiv um, is published by Russian Library, which is run by Columbia University Press. Uh, it's worth mentioning that it is a joint Russian and Anglo-American um, venture. The editorial board is 50-50 Russian, Anglo-American, and it has joint financing from the press and a consortium of Russian philanthropists. And what's interesting about the series is its intellectual ambition. Uh, it has the aim of making available not more Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and other household names to English readers, but instead opening up some of the less well-known riches of Russian literature, and they are very considerable. Now, three of the projects, uh, of the four projects I've just described, Montesquieu, Karamzin, Radishev, are works of travel literature, as you may have noticed. And travel literature in the 18th century is a preferred form of cultural critique. Uh, you invent a pair of foreign tra travelers, like Montesquieu's Persians, and you send them into French homes or English homes or German homes, institutions, tourist sites, and the narrative captures their reaction to all things that you as a native thought you knew so well, but now see from a different perspective. So it's a very productive um, literary form in the Enlightenment, a very uh, productive way of uh, changing places. Uh, and these books try to articulate what values are universal to the human species and what practices and, uh, and cultural norms are more local. Uh, so there's an ethnographic cum anthropological angle um, as well, as those of you who know the 18th century um, will be well aware. So Karamzin's traveler in this absolutely wonderful book um, heads to Europe to visit cultural capitals and interview scientists, natural philosophers, and to do his version of the Grand Tour. It's a very brainy Grand Tour. He does actually, he visits Westminster Cathedral and comments on a performance of the Messiah. Um, he hears. Now, what differentiates Radishev's journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow, um, back to that, from these other travel accounts, is that his journey is internal. His traveler treats his own country like a foreign land. Uh, the book is in 23 chapters, each of which is named for a post station where the traveler stops to rest and sometimes change horses. I think you can see in the background, there's something of a map, a ghostly map there. And here is here, here you have the entire itinerary um, so in all of the postal stations named, there's a main road along which um, all of these stations are located. Um, I'm not sure how long the journey would have taken uh, if a traveler um, did it direct without stopping. Uh, the narrative doesn't actually pay that much attention to, to time, uh, but the geography uh, is the kind of main uh, narrative horizontal axis of the book. So if the work is a fictional journey, although the postal stations are real, and Radisha's book is a highly complex literary work. Uh, the genre of travel literature hasn't got all that many literary restrictions or rules, apart from getting the voyager from one destination to the next. Uh, as he proceeds along this itinerary, the narrator strings together stories out of all sorts of material. Stopping at an inn, he finds some papers. So that's uh, a pretty typical device. Uh, in 18th century fiction, he finds a bunch of papers and he reads a detailed account of how bribery works in the upper echelons of government, and that is shared with us, reproduced in the text. He arrives at a village where he witnesses the heart-rending separation of a conscripted peasant soldier and separation from his family. On another occasion, the traveller meets an old friend and hears tales of debauchery and arranged marriages. At another, he is accosted by prostitutes and ponders uh, sexual exploitation and the effects of venereal disease. At another, he meets another old friend, a distinguished lawyer or jurist, who has left the judiciary because of an unjust trial of some serfs who murdered their master in self-defense. So Radishev's journey takes place in a recognizable Russian landscape and represents social relations and violence credibly. Other chapters, e even if it isn't entirely a work of realism, uh, other chapters contain remarkable discourses called projects for the future, so utopian visions. One of these is an allegorical dream about a ruler has become blinded to the truth by her corrupt courtiers and cataracts grow over her eyes. They can only be removed by a wise visitor. 
And it's interesting to think that cataract operations separately are a theme written about by Diderot, the great French philosopher who spent nine months in St. Petersburg at Catherine's invitation. So there is a portrait of um, Diderot painted by uh, Dmitry Levitsky, very accomplished um, contemporary uh, Russian portrait painter, uh, done in the same year. So Diderot spent um, nine months um, in St. Petersburg. Famously, Catherine said she was happy to see the back of him because he um, came up with schemes for ruling that were written in the air, where she had to rule in the real world. And also he had a habit of pummeling her thighs uh, when he got very excited. They had coffee, a Levinses, as it were. He would get terribly excited about making a point. And she said that he left her black and blue. Um, uh, but it, it was very much to Diderot's credit that he visited. There are other distinguished um, thinkers such as D'Alembert, um, who refused Catherine's invitation, and that led to a cooling off of their correspondence and friendship. In the book, you also have a chapter that provides an essay on censorship, but very oddly, censorship in Germany. Uh, another chapter discusses the norms of literary style, and the book ends with a eulogy to a great man of science, Mikhail Lamanosov, who is seen as a Prometheus figure, uh, and very much um, linked to the um, to Russia's natural resources and the discovery of mineral wealth. Uh, he's a geologist as well as a chemist and a physicist and great poet. So Radishev's book also owes a, owes a certain amount to a notorious colonial journey. It's the Abbé Renard's Histoire des Deux Andes, the third edition of which had by then appeared, containing po passages possibly written by Diderot, attacking slavery, um, and there are passages in Radisha's work on the sourcing of luxury and sugar consumption that also give it a clear anti-colonialist spin. And, as, and of, of course, as all of you know, 90 or 90% 90 plus of the Russian population were serfs. Uh, serfdom is essentially in 17th century, in legal terms, it's a 17th century institution. Uh, the Russian people were not always um, enslaved or enserfed. Uh, so it is a fairly late development uh, and a, and there's a complex economic system of exploitation um, in place um, that governs relations between the serfs and then the landed gentry who um, are um, also responsible for staffing the great imperial bureaucracies. So what you have in Radishev's work is um, a quasi-fictional travel account that combines different forms sometimes written in the sentimental manner of Lawrence's, Lawrence Stern's Sentimental Journey, sometimes essayistic, sometimes novelistic, sometimes theatrical. Satire of corrupt officialdom and judiciary was a common theme in comedies of the period. Representation of slave or serf rebellions was unprecedented. So that is one great innovation and one of the factors I think that led to Radishev's clash with the Empress. But was it really incendiary is the question that has been dogging me for a while and to which I'll return in a few minutes. Who was the author? What did he hope to achieve? Why did it all backfire? And I think Radish's story is particularly important and poignant because in some ways he's a typical man of the period, uh, a typical, not well, a typical um, member of um, the elite, educated Russian elite, the period, and he represents to, in some degree the embodiment of all of Catherine's aspirations for her adoptive country. Uh, Radishev's own life story is in some ways a remarkable success story of social engineering used to create an educated administrative elite to run a country and Catherine was really the, the social engineer here. Born in Moscow in 1749, Radishev was the scion of a wealthy provincial nobleman, a descendant of a Tartar prince who entered Russian service under Ivan the Terrible. His well-educated father strove to provide the best possible education to his 11 children, and the future writer spent the first years of his life on one of his father's numerous estates, was taught at home, this is a typical educational model, and then beginning in 1756 or 1757, he lodged in the Moscow house of a relative on his mother's side. In 1762, and this is more unusual, the young Radishev entered state service as a page to the newly enthroned empress. Um, the Russian Empire, you might want to be reminded, was organized in five classes. So at the apex was the monarch, some of the old aristocracy, then the gentry, comprising the landed gentry and the service gentry, who owed their status to the crown. The political arrangements between crown and the gentry changed considerably during Catherine's reign. 
It's a complex matter from which two relevant points can be extracted. First, the gentry were newly permitted to own their lands as private property. So um, the establishment of private property uh, in Russia at this time in law was a first. Second, the obligation to do service to the crown was abolished in 1785, sending landed nobles back to their estates, partly with the aim that they would invest more time and capital in improving agricultural efficiency and possibly reform the treatment of the serfs on whose labor estate revenue depended. So Radishev was, throughout that 20 year, 23 year span, Radishev um, was um, at the center of things and witnessed things. He knew this world firsthand, the world of the estate, but also the world of the imperial bureaucracy and court. His education at court continued at the um, core of pages where he studied physics, mathematics, geography, and languages. He was then one of a select group of 12 young members of the nobility to be sent to Leipzig University in 1766 to further their education. A separate cohort was sent to um, Scotland uh, to study uh, the law, jurisprudence. So the foundation for Radishev's knowledge of a wide range of enlightenment ideas uh, about all sorts of things, including the body and soul, uh, as well as about political economy and the law was laid during his Leipzig years. His period in Leipzig was formative, not only educationally, but politically and emotionally as well. On his return to Russia, he served as a military lawyer until his retirement in 1775. He resumed his service career in 1778. A civil servant of distinction and ability, he had a practical grasp of policy implementation. So he visited the port cities on the Baltic to see things with his own eyes. Radishev seems never to have put a foot wrong. His numerous writings in these years, whether the life of a friend, so he's the author of the first um, biography of a Russian philosopher, a friend who died young, uh, his memorandum on taxation, his autobiographical prose, uh, and many other documents, make him something of a philosophe. Uh, so uh, make him something of a, um, a, a philosophe. He translated book three of Montesquieu's uh, considerations on the causes of the grandeur of the Romans and their decadence or fall, apparently done under the supervision of Catherine the Great's secretary, A. V. Hrapavitsky in 1773. Uh, and he also translated um, the Abbe de Mably's observations on the history of Greece, or the causes of its prosperity, uh, the causes of the prosperity and the misfortunes of the Greeks from the same year, 1766. And you can see in those two works, in the title of those two works, an interest in philosophy of history, which will come back at the end of this, which I'll refer to at the end of this talk. So and I, th I think these works of enlightenment thought, which he chose to translate, give some idea of the basis of Radishev's thinking about history, progress, the importance of law and governance. His reading, it is important to point out, is highly congruent with Catherine the Great's own intellectual diet. When the Senate passed gubernatorial reforms in 1780, Radishev was seconded to the director of St. Petersburg Customs, assuming oversight for trade, entering the port at St. Petersburg, in which capacity he was said to have commanded the respect of his colleagues for his incorruptibility in juxtaposition to the venality of officialdom as much illustrated in the journey from St. Petersburg. He made, stead he made steady progress up the ranks. So the Russian society uh, is organized very strictly according to a ranking system, the table of ranks. Uh, uh, there's a civilian one, there's a military one established by Peter the Great in the attempt to create um, uh, a meritocracy um, um, in the civil service and in the gentry based on accomplishment. Um, so he made steady progress up the ranks and was promoted uh, repeatedly. In 1789, he was designated director of St. Petersburg Customs. So a high-flying civil servant, an indispensable advisor on drafting legislation, an expert on taxation and commercial treaties. His arrest intervened before he actually assumed that post. Uh, on January 15, 1783, so if we move back a decade, Catherine the Great had issued a UK's that allowed privately owned presses. Uh, so until that point, um, presses were owned by the state uh, and run by the state. So from this moment on, it was possible to set up your own press. And the regulation ushered a period, it ushered in a period of, period of glassness, uh, meaning openness. Print culture boomed. There was very little censorship. There was a huge uh, growth in printing, the opening of bookshops, partly to meet the demands of growing university numbers. 
Radishev acquired a hand press in 1789 and in May 1790 printed at his own expense anonymously the only copies of the journey to circulate in his lifetime. And here is, um, so these are the end papers or this is the title page. It's a very fine piece of printing um, done by him. Um, this is a copy um, I looked at, inspected at Harvard University and Houghton Library. I was working on something else. I had no idea it was there. I just thought to myself, you know, if any library has one of the very, very rare extant copies, it might be Harvard. And there it was. It was terribly moving, um, terribly moving to see it. Uh, now, it's been calculated that Radishev had cleared about 60% of the text with the censor. Cens censorship in Catherine's Russia was very, very light touch. Um, so, you know, he'd gone to the trouble uh, of clearing it with the censor. And after he got approval, uh, he added about 40% of new material um, for publication. So between 1788 and 1790. Now, whether his intention was to provoke explicitly is a matter for interpretation. It was certainly unfortunate for him that Catherine, ever a voracious reader and micromanager, acquired a copy. What exactly enraged her is both easy and hard to see. And that's the problem I'm going to come back to shortly. Her reaction was atypical for her. And it's worth noting that Russia in the 18th century, unlike France, was not a country where books were burned and authors thrown into prison, at least not until now. Between 1792 and 1794, so after Regis's arrest, copies of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar were confiscated, think about that, and 825 copies of 67 titles were burned, including, including a complete, uh, a full set of Voltaire, uh, which is extraordinary because one of the great 18th century correspondences is between Catherine the Great and Voltaire. And Catherine, by this point, had acquired Voltaire's library, which had been relocated to St. Petersburg. So um, a symbolic gesture in seven, between 1793-1794. In but in 1790, Radisha produced this book, must have been a huge labor on a hand press to print 650 copies of a substantial text. Um, and it was a very large print run since most books sold no more than 300 copies at the time. He must have hoped his work would, uh, was going to attract wide interest among the educated elite. Some copies were sold, several Radish have sent to his friends and acquaintances. The rest he destroyed when he learned that the authorities were looking for the book's author. Um, some of the purchasers of copies um, had their copies confiscated, had their homes invaded, and their copies confiscated. Catherine acquired her own copy, which survives with her marginal notes, harshly condemning many of the book's ideas and denouncing the author as a dangerous rebel. By June 1790, Catherine had determined her own satisfaction, Radishev's authorship. Uh, her initial suspicions that he had an accomplice co-author were, re were rejected. He was, in her words, a rebel even worse than Pugachev. Pugachev uh, was the Cossack rebel um, who led a massive uprising in 1774 that sorely tested, that sorely destabilized her, her reign. So she said he was even worse than Pugachev. He was arrested on 30th June after an investigation directed by Count Alexander Bisbarotka, one of Catherine's most valuable, valued statesmen and a man of cultivated sensibility who argued for leniency. On the one hand, he felt that Radishev had in no way violated, violated the letter of the law since free presses were permitted by the Empress's decree. On the other hand, the immediate context of the French Revolution was impossible to ignore, as were passages in Radisha's book devoted to the establishment of equality and praise of, of the regicide Cromwell. Uh, in fact, this was a misreading because Cromwell is uh, condemned. I had a nice note yesterday from Blair Worden, our emeritus fellow, who's a great expert on Cromwell, saying he'd hoped to attend today. He couldn't, and I was somewhat crestfallen because uh, uh, I thought the Cromwell reference would interest him. Uh, it was no help to Radishev that the rumor mill about French spies in St. Petersburg had gone into overdrive, including a suspected plot attributed to uh, Freemasons to assassinate the Empress. Evidence that the book was a succès de scandale in demand by readers, um, in, de in demand by readers, sorry, um, uh, the, uh, the investigation speaks of the great curiosity of the public for the book, so it, it looks as though it was a succès de scandale. As many as 50 copies have gone unaccounted for, and the translation was already in preparation 
um, uh, a translation was already in preparation into German. That at least was the rumor, although it was untrue. And all of that exacerbated tensions. So Radisha was arrested. He was imprisoned in the Peter and Paul fortress, which you see before you. Uh, and this is a notorious, I mean, it's a very beautiful architectural complex, but the site of a notorious prison in which many 19th century Russian radicals um, were um, interrogated, uh, were incarcerated and, and left to rot. Uh, his interrogation was conducted by Shishkovsky, who was dreaded as the head of the secret chancery. In mid-July, Radishev addressed to Shishkovsky a letter of extenuation apology intended for Catherine. The questions put to Radishev uh, in his interrogation were in effect scripted by Catherine. They asked Radishev to explain whether, quote, he feels the significance of his crime and to gloss the meaning of passages regarded as explicitly of criminal intentionality. The official charge speaks of a personal affront to the Empress and a determination to stir up the people against their masters. The death a death sentence was decreed on the 24th of July and was confirmed by the Senate in early September. Uh, in order to do this, to pass um, this death sentence, he had to be stripped of his noble status because under Catherine's legislation, uh, it was no longer legal um, to submit uh, the nobility to corporal punishment uh, of any kind. So he was stripped of his rank, he was sentenced to death, and then Catherine commuted the sentence to 10 years of exile to be spent in the barrack town of Ilimsk in Siberia. The decree noted the exceptional gesture of clemency, Milasierdia, which is an important uh, enlightenment, clemenza in Italian. Uh, one of, it's an important enlightenment value that differentiates the enlightened autocrat from the tyrant. And she said she was sparing the Russian Mirabeau, who was then sent east under armed convoy. On September the 8th, 1790, in chains and under guard, Radisha began his journey to Ilimsk, a small fortress town not far from the Angara River. And we've got a 19, uh, 20th century uh, depiction of Paul Radishev in a snowstorm. Um, in 1797, his sentence was reduced to internal exile and he was subsequently pardoned by Alexander I. Uh, there's a splendid portrait of Alexander I as a hero of the Napoleonic Wars by the English painter George Daw, just across the street from St Edmund Hall in the examination schools. Radishev committed suicide in 1802, shockingly. Uh, the work to restore his legacy began and was repeatedly, immediately, and was repeatedly rebuffed. Uh, in 1811, his sons published a three-volume compilation of his works, but the journey was omitted because of the ongoing censorship ban. For most of the 19th century, the journey remained a clandestine book, notwithstanding sporadic chapter or two anonymously published in journals in Russia and Germany. After the political turmoil of 1825, when a rebellion of over 500 strong young nobles occurred during the coronation of Nicholas I, uh, of Nicholas I, Radishev's name was taboo for a decade, and precious few readers had access to his writings. Among them was Alexander Pushkin, who may have read Radishev's travelogue in manuscript, even before purchasing in, 18, in 1835 a rare copy. So only 67 copies of Radishev's print, printing have been accounted for, including the one at Harvard. Pushkin's copy had Catherine the Great's annotations and his writings about it are fascinating, but he wasn't allowed to publish his essay on Alexander Radishev. And the rest of the 19th century, um, I've got, you know, chapter and verse here are, are, are on attempt and then re um, rebuff. Uh, it is interesting to note that in 1858, Nikolai Agaryov and Alexander Herzin, exiles based in London and often dubbed the fathers of Rus Russian socialism, published in effect a second edition of the journey in, in, their, um, in their celebrated journal, The Bell. Uh, but it was full of errors and unauthorized editorial interventions. And then really from there on in, despite many efforts um, to rehabilitate him, Radishev was a victim of cancellation um, culture. Uh, the first, uh, and in fact, mentions of his name were uh, prohibited. Uh, the first edition appeared in Russia, it was an incomplete edition in 1907 after the 1905 revolution. Uh, sign of the times that, um, or we, that it became, became possible um, to publish him after the 1905 revolution, he had endorsements from the most important new political leaders of all, especially after the revolution. So Lenin had this to say, more than anything we can see and feel the brutality 
the knout and the persecution to which czarist executioners, nobles and capitalists subjected our beautiful country. We are proud of the fact that this brutality elicited resistance from our own milieu, from the milieu of Russia, that this milieu produced Radishev, the Decembrists, the, the revolutionary um, agitators who have altered, um, uh, uh, who have altered the country's fortunes. The Bolsheviks elevated Radishev to the pantheon of revolutionary heroes. Stalin went so far as to create revolutionary Red uh, Russia with Radishev. So now, what does the 18th century scholar see? That's one of my, uh, my wearing my hat as an 18th century scholar. And this takes us to the final part of my talk, which is really the question, what made the journey so dangerous? What we have is a powerful backstory about a book that was in fact little known, except in clandestine excerpts, where there is a unanimous consensus on something, then I think there is potential for revision. Uh, so um, call me a gadfly, I see a problem here. Um, and it is obvious why one would want to associate Radishev with the outbursts of radical thought and republicanism that occurred in the open, that burst into the open in the 1770s, 1780s, 1790s, during the revolutionary era in America, France, Britain, and the Netherlands. And he was aware of these revolutions, and even now new research is going on trying to um, describe and pinpoint exactly what he knew about the Declaration of Independence in the colonies, the Bill of Rights, and so on. Um, the argument for Radisha's radicalism has been, has in effect been made ex hoc propter hoc, namely, he was punished by Catherine and punishment, punishment must fit and define the crime. When the work was finally published in a modern edition, its reception was highly politicized in a Marxist-Leninist country. So such a reception has powerfully conditioned how the journey has been understood, and not only in Russia. American scholarship in the 1960s also promoted the view that Radishev was Russia's first radical in a Cold War context that made out of him an antagonist of totalitarianism. In the face of overwhelming consensus, the only scholarly thing to do is question and be skeptical, or at least that's my habit. So my own life with this text has evolved. About 20 years ago, I wrote a paper and subsequent uh, article for uh, an event, a symposium hosted by the Social Science Research Council. Uh, and that paper called into question the assumption that the journey was political literature. That argument tried to rebalance the emphasis onto the work's literary qualities and the connection, and to look at the connection between affect and critical thinking, to say that Radishev's style, his use of storytelling, was a way of opening the minds of his readers. He had a great interest in psychology. He was informed in theories of the mind. He understood or knew contemporary medical theories of sensibility and the imagination. He believed that a literary text could move people to examine their positions on social questions. So, you know, two decades later, I've begun work on a new project about uh, enlightenment in Russia. It's a, a book project conceived more in the manner of history of ideas than literary criticism. And the context for under that context uh, is a different context for understanding the journey. Um, it's a context that's much more about Catherine the Great's governance reforms and economic policies. So the way I see it is that in 1790, after serving under a monarch who had enshrined, enshrined social reforms in several important legislative packages, Radishev attempted to synthesize in one literary work of a complex nature a lifetime spent in various forms of study of natural and comparative law, the laws of the Russian Empire, taxation systems, and comparative legislation. Uh, in the political reading of Radishev, the smoking gun has always been a single speech in a chapter in which a member of the nobility agrees to serve as the defense attorney for a serf family accused of murdering their masters, albeit in self-defense, after the master and sons committed a rape. The key passage, which is not to be examined here, we haven't got time and I've written an article about it uh, in a book called Democratic Moments, um, edited by a political scientist. Um, the key passage puts forward a case for social justice based on natural law, and it uses egalitarian vocabulary that echoes the rights argument that had recently been proclaimed in the French Revolutionary Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. I haven't got a slide of that, but this is in the Gare du Nord, uh, which is a, a latter-day um, affirmation uh, by the French of um, the um, rights of man. So, so th the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen was this great revolutionary text published in 1790, around the same time that Radishiv was um, writing up and printing his own work. Uh, he knew about it. 
So when seen from that immediate context, the speech of the nobleman defending the serfs who had uh, murdered their master might look insurrection, insurrectionary, although few commentators have actually bothered to point out that while the lawyer does not win the case, his clients have access to justice in the end and are not punished because the new owner of the estate, the master's widow, puts her own economic interest ahead of revenge. She grants them clemency because she needs their labor. When seen in the Russian context, much of the speech is congruent with the values espoused by Catherine herself in her legislative reforms. So the language Radisha puts in the mouth of one of his characters is very, very familiar and famous Catherinian language. And this single chapter about a serf rebellion deals with the vocabulary of human rights, but it is defined, I would say, by the lower limits on tolerable human conduct. It doesn't advocate franchise. Um, it advocates forms of self-preservation in, in a state of nature. Uh, there is some degree of Lockean um, contract, idea of contract there, but it doesn't actually go um, that far. Now in 1767, Five years after she took the throne, Catherine had published um, her law code. This is the grand instruction to the commissioners appointed to frame a new code of laws for the Russian Empire. Uh, that's the title of the English translation that appeared in 1768. Here you've got a French, um, a French version. Um, I think this is from Also's library. It, uh, it was a statement of principle that her reign would be conducted according to the laws of the Russian Empire, newly codified, consistent with the practices and tenets expounded by influential contemporary or near contemporary thinkers, including Montesquieu and the Italian um, Cesare Beccaria, foremost among them. So Radisha was a member of the legislative commission that drafted this, this document, a showcase uh, of her understanding of European theories of government and Montesquieu above all was borrowed from. Article 13 of the instruction the Nakaz asks, what is the true end of monarchy? Not to deprive people of their natural liberty, but to correct their actions in order to attain the supreme good. And Article 14 says, the form of government which best attains this end and at the same time sets less bounds than others to natural liberty is that, that which coincides with the views and purposes of rational creatures and answers the end upon which we ought to fix a steadfast eye in the re regulations of a civil polity. Montesquieu had argued that modern slavery was economically inefficient and also that it was corrupting to both master and slave, views towards which we can imagine Radisha being sympathetic, and it is clear that Catherine herself was sympathetic to these, um, to these um, views. She founded the free economic, oh here's another image of Catherine like Moses giving these laws, um, there's the Russian, a Russian version. Here is, um, these are, this is the annual of the um, free society, this is the annual of the Free Economic Society for the Cultivation of Agriculture and Building, um, which is sort of a think tank established by Catherine that lasted all the way to 1918. Um, they published lots and lots of information on um, land grants, land management, all this sort of thing. Um, I want to wind up um, there's a lot of information I could share, but I'll refrain on the attempts Catherine made to reform agriculture, not from top down, but from the bottom up. Um, she tried to give more autonomy and management to the nobles, encourage them to go back to the land, um, establish courts, establish good practice, exploit the peasants, the serfs less. Instances of cruelty and exploitation were punished. Uh, during her reign. But the key thing in all of this is that um, of that class of landed gentry, sort of 98% were actually quite poor. It's been estimated that 40 to 55% of all serfs were owned by the upper 1 or 1.5% of the landed gentry. And that group of 1% also overlaps significantly with the upper echelons of the bureaucracy. Uh, so we're talking about a cohort of 250 figures and families. So although the perception was that power in Russia flowed down from the monarch at the apex, in reality, the power of the sovereign flowed up from the support of these families. So an ameliorative program of reforms was the best Catherine could implement. Abolition of serfdom would have lost their support. And I think in that context, it's not likely that Radishev himself um, was assuming the posture of, ab of an abolitionist. By 1790, Radishev had seen that the monarch could translate principles into political action with only limited success. 
So it may be that his crime was to press her beyond her comfort zone. Or we might look again at his work in the light of the priorities Catherine herself articulated in 1790. Um, in her official denunciation of the writer, she referred to personal affront. The word for affront or insult is abida, and I think it is meaningful. In Russian legal culture, it denoted offense. Offense is a personal injury, like libel or slander. It's not les majeste, it's an infringement of one's personal honor. So from the start of her reign, Catherine was statist and outlook. L'état c'est moi was the philosophy of her rule, and she was vigorous in rebutting criticism of Russia. She refuted the view held chiefly by French visitors to the country that Russia was an Asiatic power or civilization. As she wrote to Voltaire on the 31st of March, 17, oh, that's Catherine, sorry, that's Cornucopia there, that's Voltaire. Uh, in general, our nation has the most fortunate proclivities in the world. There is nothing easier than giving them, meaning the Russians, a taste for what is good and reasonable. And of course, she's writing as a German. When this nation becomes better known in Europe, people recover from the many errors and prejudices that they have about Russia. So Catherine was essentially an optimist who believed in the progressive course of history. Radishev, on the other hand, was a historical pessimist, and he expressed his vision in a passage of the journey that has been overlooked, very little discussed. Take pride, vain builders of cities, and you could read this for yourselves, but basically Radishev's analysis here, going back to Montesquieu, going back to Mably, is that all empires end in ruins. Now, Catherine was not a philosopher king in the manner of Frederick the Great, but she was intelligent, she was well read, she thought very hard about the dynamic of history, she was herself an amateur historian. She clearly believed in the agency of visionary leaders to master events. Towards the end of her reign, the Empress saw Russia as a force for stability, pitted against the forces of anarchy and chaos she identified with the French Revolution. Her endorsement of absolutism against all forms of popular rule was a defense of a set of economic, cultural, and social legacies that she regarded as the civilizational achievement of her reign. Revolution, she believed, had reduced France to barbarism, that's her word, that undid the advances of the age of reason. Her picture of France at this time uh, and one can read her letters to get a clear sense that she's up to the minute and very alarmed, was essentially cast in the terms Radishev uses in the passage you've got before you. But Russia, she argued in the letters she wrote, would remain a bulwark of the tolerance, reason, and advance in social welfare she believed she had fostered as a pragmatic, enlightened ruler. Radishev clearly didn't see it that way. He thought the writing was on the wall. Catherine's period of flourishing was in the age of great absolute rulers. Uh, to conclude, uh, by the 1790s, she was nearly the last of her kind. Frederick the Great, her great rival and nemesis in realpolitik in the East and on the continent, in the East meaning Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. Frederick died in 1786. Joseph II, the Holy Roman Emperor, an admirer of her land reform legislation who had visited Russia and traveled with Catherine down the Volga to witness her colonial projects, died in 1790. And Louis XVI, who, having made in Catherine's view a bad blunder in making concessions to the Assemblée Nationale, was doomed. She viewed stability as a sine qua non of good kingship and the result of good kingship. In her letters, she reacted with horror to the French Revolution as it unfolded. She saw its consequences as civilizational and political. The civilizational related to the destruction of a century's worth of achievements that had changed all of Europe, Russia included. The revolutionaries had, quote, usurped power in France and are making a vast desert inhabited by the most ferocious animals who have ever blighted the earth. Equivalent to this, this is Hubert Robert, his vision of the Louvre in ruins, or um, Fuseli's, um, um, uh, this is the wreckage, what remains um, of um, the Ancien Regime, uh, just those bits of um, statuary. With the clock ticking down on her reign, she worried that, quote, the end of the century had demonstrated that the much vaunted 18th century wasn't a farthing more valuable than the centuries that preceded it. But she didn't believe that statement. Russia's time had now come as a defender of all that the old system had achieved. In her marginal notes on her copy of Radisha's book, Catherine referred to, quote, the French delusion and saw the author as someone who had, quote, been infected by France. Catherine was not ready to accept this picture as the final report card on her reign or be called a low life by a writer whose pessimistic philosophy of history was a fatal diagnosis for all empires. I believe she meant it when she accused him foremost of personal affront for this reason, the reason I've just um, articulated here. 
Rajisha's fall from grace can be told without simplification as a bitter clash between two visions of history rather than just a story of tyranny opposed. So I hope you enjoyed your lunch and thank you very much. I shall clap on behalf of everybody. Um, thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating. I, I've certainly learnt, learnt huge amounts. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. If you'd like to raise your hand, um, I can, and then unmute yourself. That might be the easiest way. Do we have any questions? I've got to look at three pages. I think if anyone wants to ask a question about the translation itself or the literary quality of the, the text, I didn't really refer to, to that, uh, except in passing. I'm happy to answer, you know, on any questions, really, um, about 18th century Russia uh, that come to mind. Uh, Wes. Hello. OK, you um, said that there was something unreadable or and or translatable about this text. Yeah. Um, what is it? So uh, th that's, uh, yeah, so the epigraph to the text um, is, um, the epigraph to the text is a phrase from a poem, uh, a version of the Odyssey called the Telem Telemechiad by a writer named Trijakovsky, who by the late 18th century was thought by his fellow Russians to be pretty unreadable. Um, so that tells you something. Uh, Trijakovsky was notorious for his difficult style and Radishev, and he was an archaic sort of writer. Radishev turned his back on the smooth style that had been developed. Uh, some years ago, um, I was interviewed by the BBC on a Pushkin anniversary and the journalist asked me, said, you know, Dr. Khan, tell us how Pushkin invited the, invented the Russian literary language. Um, and I said, well, he didn't. And she said, she stopped the tape and she said, you can't say that. Everyone knows he did. And I said, well, they're wrong. Uh, so that was broadcast at three in the morning, of course. And, you know, that was my first scrape. But anyway, the point is that there was a vernacular literary language that had been developed from the secular, from the ecclesiastical language. And Rajishev sort of turned his back on it and created this weird hybrid, um, hybrid um, language full of archaisms, elevated speech, syntactic constructions that didn't really exist anymore in modern Russian. So a very artificial language, which slows the reader down and makes one, and he was capable of writing perfectly fine Russian. So it makes one wonder, you know, the, the, for, in the Soviet Union, of course, he's seen as a great realist because that's the touchstone of satire, you have to be real. But in fact, he's invented a kind of literary language that suggests the whole narrative is something of a, a lab experiment. I don't want to hog the questions, but have you tried to reproduce that in your translation then? Or have you sort of flattened no, it out in some no, sense? Or? No. Well, no, it's, un I mean, it would, this, it, uh, the text would be totally unreadable if we had. <laughs> We've tried to convey some effects. So, you know, instead of using the word priest, uh, for priest, if Rajishiv uses the modern word for priest, we'll say priest. But if he uses a, a very obscure word, a coinage even, we say hierophant, that would be an example. So I think we aim, we aim to be very readable and fluent, to carry over some of the syntactic convolutions of his style. But no, it, I think it would be impossible to do what he's done in any, yeah. In, in, Thank you. Thanks. And we've got time for one more question. Is there any other question? I can't see any in the I, I saw James Howarth had his hand raised. <clears throat> yes, I was just going to say if someone wants to read it, there is a copy available in the library. <laughs> so, uh... Fantastic. Right, if there are no other questions, we are running out of time as well. I, we have to finish absolutely at two o'clock for other meetings. Um, that just leaves me to say thank you very much, Andrew. That's a fascinating and a brilliant start to our, our fellowship seminars. And very much look forward to welcoming you all to the next one, which will be in fourth week. And that will be Professor Joanna Bell, our law fellow, who's going to talk about some of the work she's been doing. So thank you very much for joining us. And please do email Andrew with your questions if you prefer to do that directly as well. It's good to see you all. Bye bye. Thank you.